Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the IBA webinar. My name is Christiana and I'm product manager at IBA. Today is our webinar and why PSMA. As the title suggests, PSMA has been considered disruptive technology. The PSMA technology is bringing fundamental changes in the management of prostate cancer patients. Most of studies are with Gallium PSMA 11, which is the second most used tracer today after FDG. The F18 version is now being investigated as well. IBA is very happy to have this very instructive webinar where two renowned medical doctors, Dr. Fanti and Dr. Amaral, will share their clinical experience. In the first presentation, we will focus on the well-established Gallium PSMA 11. And the other one, we introduce the most recent tracer, the F18 version, F18 PSMA 1007, giving more possibilities to the end users. I'll first introduce our speakers. Dr. Fanti is a professor of diagnostic imaging and director of nuclear medicine division in the Ursula Polyclinical Hospital. He's author of more than a thousand papers and his PET unit has carried out more than 12,000 exams, including 2,000 non-FDG scans. They are considered one of the most active centers in Europe. Dr. Amaral is the president of Positron Pharma and director of Positron Pharma in Chile Foundation. He has 30 years of experiences in clinical research and teaching in nuclear medicine. His papers have been published in national and international journals. His team has performed over 100 F18 PSMA 1007 PET scans during the last two months. Here are some instructions about before we start the webinar. The presentation should take 20 minutes each, and there will be a Q&A for 20 to 15 minutes in the end. You can enter your questions in the question box, as you can see in the screen. So the question box is on webinar too. You can enter your questions, and we'll, they'll be answered in the end of the webinar. If you would like to share about this webinar, you can go and put in the social media. You can use the hashtag mentioned here in the screen, PSMA Pet CT. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this webinar, and I thank you already, Dr. Fanti and Dr. Amaral. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Stefano Fanti from Bologna, working in PET since a long time, and I'll try to introduce you to the topic of clinical application of Gallium PSMA 11 in prostate cancer, so to pave the way for the next lecture of Dr. Amaral. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here to share with you um, our experience uh, on Gallium PSMA 11. Uh, well, as everybody know, is really something that has been exploding in the last years. Uh, I've been in the field since a long time, but few things have been so successful as uh, PSMA has been recently. Uh, well, everything started something like uh, eight years ago. That's the first publication that I was able to find uh, uh, about uh, animal uh, imaging using uh, gallium laser at PSMA. And the first uh, human publication came from Heidelberg uh, five years ago. It was uh, very well weighted and uh, uh, expected from the scientific nuclear medicine community. And since then, uh, uh, there has been really an incredible production of scientific articles. Now we can count about 400 original articles uh, since 2012. Last year, almost two hundreds articles have been published. So it's really something uh, that has gone uh, very well. Uh, and I use this slide to show that there is a flourishing of centers all around the world who are performing a Gallium PSMA. It's, it's incredible how rapidly it's spread uh, really through the entire world because uh, uh, it started from Germany, as we said, but now it goes to South America, Australia, um, the USA, uh, e Asia, South Africa, well, uh, really everywhere, everywhere there are great uh, centers doing this great imaging. So uh, I, I will try to uh, give you a clinical perspective. Giving this talk, uh, I made up my mind uh, that I could have done um, uh, a methodological talk uh, or uh, a clinically oriented talk uh, and uh, well, Talking about methods, uh, as you know, for prostate cancer, we can have uh, ultrasound, CT, bone scanning, MRI, and on top of that, PET. Uh, in my impression, it's quite a boring perspective to make comparison between methods. Uh, so I prefer to have a more clinically oriented lecture 
taking into account which are the clinical need of uh, the urologist or the oncologist or the radiation oncologist referring patients to us. Uh, and if you think clinical, the scenario where you can use PET is in primary diagnosis, so identify the cancer, or staging, so when the patient is diagnosed to establish the extent of the disease or biochemical recurrency, or finally therapy planning. So I, I will go step by step through uh, these four situations, try to uh, share with you which are our experience. Well, for what about diagnosis, uh, uh, and I will refer to the guidelines of the European Association of Urology, uh, there's no mention at all about PET imaging. So uh, it, it's essentially about other methods. Uh, and uh, I, I guess uh, uh, we published uh, more than a decade ago a paper about the use of Colin in this scenario. Uh, that was very disappointing because, as everybody knows, uh, Colin uh, uh, has a very poor specificity in this uh, in this area. This has been confirmed later on by other papers, so I guess that nobody is now proposing uh, the use of Colin for making primary diagnosis of prostate cancer. That's what we are talking about. Uh, that's the first slide that I presented last year at EAU. Uh, about a lecture that was asked me to give if Colin is outdated. Well, the answer was surely yes. Colin PET is clearly an outdated method. And so we now have a few, really just a few publications on PSMA 11 in primary diagnosis. Um, of course, with something like three or four publications, the data are clearly very, very limited. And I'm quoting one of the paper. Um, the data are really, really limited and covering patients with a very high uh, risk of having a cancer. So uh, I guess it's very preliminary. And uh, indeed, probably I'm a bit pessimistic, but I'm trying to be even realistic at the same time. I guess that for primary diagnosis, PSMA PET at present has no role because my opinion is that it's always a good idea to not make promise we cannot fulfill to the clinician. So for what about uh, primary diagnosis? Uh, we are expecting uh, more data, but at present there's no role. Now let's move to staging. Uh, again, referring to the EAU guideline, uh, there's no mention of PET. Uh, as you can see, there's mention of MRI, uh, there's mention of bone scanning, but PET is not mentioned as a, a method for staging patients. Um, there's mention of bone scintigraphy, and it's quite interesting. That's a method that's been introduced more than 40 years ago, and it's still surviving. That's very interesting for us. Um, at the same time, Colin is not mentioned, and I guess everybody knows the reason. The, the sensitivity, I'm referring to two meta-analyses that have been published a few years ago. Well, the pooled sensitivity, as you can see, is quite low. It's in the range of 40-something percent, less than 50 percent. So with such a poor sensitivity, uh, it's clear that there is a very limited role, if almost uh, no role for Colin Pett in staging of prostate cancer. Now, in, in this area, the situation is clearly better for PSMA. Uh, there has been, uh, this is one of the first publication from the group in Munich who reported uh, a better sensitivity of about uh, 70%. Uh, that is uh, definitely clearly better and uh, suggested a potential use of PSMA PET for staging, especially, of course, lymph node. There's no doubt that the local staging is uh, is a domain of MRI, but uh, the nodal and the M staging uh, a PSMA PET can be useful. And in this area, we have several papers that came out. And what's interesting is that probably we have to focus uh, on the patients which may really benefit for a, from a PSMA scans, which are likely to be the high risk prostate cancer patient. Uh, I, I'm Presenting to you a case that has just been presented in the plenary session of EAU, which has been held last week in Copenhagen by my friend and colleague Alberto Briganti. It's a very interesting case of a patient relatively young with a PSA not so high, 12.6, 
which has a lesion documented at ultrasound and confirmed by a guided biopsy to be an abdominal carcinoma with a Gleason score of eight. And then the patients underwent MRI for local staging. And again, the only lesion uh, which is seen is on the left lobe of the prostate and bone scintigraphy and the CT, which again are recommended in the guidelines, turned out uh, to be negative. Uh, but the patient, uh, apart from the MRI staging, underwent a gallium PSMA scan uh, in our institution. As you can see, uh, the local uh, disease is confirmed, but there is also a lymph node in the presacral area, as well as two bone lesion in a rib and here in the iliac bone. And so there's clearly a completely different staging with conventional imaging and PSMA. PSMA. So the point raised up is that uh, you will have uh, probably in high risk patients uh, a, a more relevant number of oligometastatic disease that will pose a very important uh, clinical question. That's very much in line with a paper that I really like uh, recently, recently published uh, really a, a few weeks ago, which conclude uh, that in patient at high risk, uh, so you have to select the patient to submit to PSMA scan uh, at presentation, there could be a relevant role of PSMA scanning. So uh, my, my impression, uh, I'm sorry that the font uh, is not perfect, is that for staging, we really need uh, more publication and more data, uh, but the PSMA PET can have a very interesting potential, especially in patient uh, in uh, high risk or in terminate to high risk in order to better stage the nodal and the M status. Uh, now let's come to the biochemical recurrency. As everybody knows, uh, this has been uh, the main area of application of PET. Uh, even with Colin, this is an example of a patient. You see one lesion documented in a patient already treated with prostatectomy and uh, a lab recurrency, which has been shown. Uh, in the American, North American guideline, Colin PET has been incorporated since 2014. Uh, but at the same time, in this meta-analysis, uh, we reported a pooled detection rate of about 60% in uh, identifying uh, the recurrency. Now, 60%, it's not bad, but uh, the fact is that uh, is a function of PSA. So especially for the early recurrence, that's to say PSA lower than two or PSA lower than one, uh, when it's very important to document the lesion because it's possible to have a curative treatment, uh, well, the sensitivity of colon is really very low in the range of 20 to 30%. Uh, so I used to, see, to, to say that colon PET-CT is a glass F empty or F full, but mostly F empty, especially in the early biochemical recurrency. So we were very happy and excited uh, where the first publication reported, uh, and again, this is a paper from Heidelberg, uh, a very better uh, sensitivity of PSMA PET in this particular setting. Uh, it was 2012, uh, and again, it has been confirmed by a number of papers. I'm just showing you one of the many examples. We are now almost routinely using PSMA scan in this situation. A gentleman treated with radical prostatectomy, and then there is a lab recurrency, a short doubling time, and as we can see, the only site uh, it's uh, at the bone area. So that makes clearly a difference for the therapy of the patient. Uh, and that's been confirmed. This is the largest publication series so far, more than 1,000 patients with uh, uh, sensitivity, which is in the range of 80%, so clearly much better than Colin. And uh, uh, that's the typical example that I'm showing you of what gallium PSMA scanning is providing to you uh, in patient of uh, lab recurrency evaluation. In, in one single exam, you will have all the information, you see the hotspots here, about uh, the possible recurrency uh, at the level of the prostatic bed, uh, at the level of the nodes, uh, or at the level of the bone. And it's a very patient-friendly exam, and the uh, target to background ratio is so incredibly better as compared to Colin, for example, that uh, reporting the images is really a great pleasure for the reader. Uh, 
there's already a meta-analysis that have been published uh, a couple of years ago by Australian colleagues, uh, and they found a pullet sensitivity of 80%, so clearly superior to Colin. Uh, and the very good news is that the beta superiority is still present for low PSA values. So uh, we can really use um, PSMA PET uh, in the early recurrence setting, which is uh, the more challenging uh, by the clinical point of view situation, because uh, the earlier you treat the patient, the more is likely to be curative uh, what you are performing. Um, that's a comparison that we did among uh, uh, the different tracer available. There's no paper making direct comparison in the same patient because, of course, it, it, it's much questionable by the ethical point of view to be done. But if you simply uh, found a publication, as you can see, in, in the PSA lower than one, so in the early recurrence setting, the detection rate of colin is in the range of, as I said, 20 to 40 percent. Uh, FACBC uh, it, it's uh, a little bit better, but the uh, PSMA is clearly better than 50 to 60 percent. Uh, and again, these are the patients uh, which can more benefit from an early therapy uh, and the more challenging one, the one that you will see on a daily basis. Uh, based on that, uh, we recently organized uh, uh, a relevant event in the area of prostate cancer imaging that has been held uh, in Valencia under the ENM organization. And there was a, a panel of 25 experts uh, who were asked to answer many questions, including this uh, uh, in the scenario of biochemical recurrency of prostate cancer. In case you are performing a PET, which tracer are you favoring? And uh, I'm sorry, it's very small uh, character, but as you can see, PSMA get 90% of the votes. So there's no doubt. Uh, uh, that PSMA is the favorite tracer at present to perform a, a, a prostate cancer target PET imaging. So in, in this scenario, which is the biochemical recurrence uh, of prostate cancer, there's no doubt that PSMA PET can play a very important uh, clinical role. Uh, and again, the, the very rapid and impressive widespread worldwide diffusion of the method is confirming that. Uh, and finally, I quoted the therapy planning, which is quite important. There are a few publications that confirm the fact that if you are especially planning um, a, a salvage radiation therapy in a, in a patient that has already been uh, operated on, uh, the PSMA PET can contribute to design uh, the, the target volume and to better uh, restage the patient in order to optimize the salvage treatment. And I'm very sure that more and more papers will come in this uh, uh, important clinical setting, uh, which is quite frequently studied right now. Again, I'm sorry, I'm coming to some conclusion and I'm there I will be, of course, very happy to address any, any possible question. Uh, in the four potential clinical situation where PSMA PET can be used again in the primary diagnosis. So to find, to identify the cancer, I guess that so far PSMA PET has no role. Maybe a new paper will come, but I'm not that sure that we can really be better than MRI. Uh, for what about staging? Uh, there are interesting uh, papers uh, and there's probably a role that has to be confirmed by more robust studies uh, but i guess there could be application in the field of patients with high risk cancer again uh, to identify those that may benefit from example for a, um, an extended lymphadenectomy or for uh, a systemic therapy uh, in the setting of biochemical recurrence uh, I would say that PET is already state of the art and it's very important to have it available for every patient which has a biochemical recurrence. And finally, there's more and more uh, application of PET in the therapy planning, especially for um, radiation therapy planning. And there's a confirmation on that. Uh, again, the EAU guidelines in 2017, again, I'm sorry, the characters are a bit small. In 2017, PSMA was introduced in the guidelines, but in the last version of the guidelines that was published something like uh, two weeks ago, 2018, as you can see, PSMA PET 
uh, is suggested with strong strength rating, uh, either in uh, recurrency after radical prostatectomy and recurrence after radiotherapy. Uh, and it's clear that it's suggested as the first method to be carried out. Uh, and um, if, if not available, then call-in could be taken into account. That's a, a very important point for our community. Uh, and it's a very important clinical application that we should uh, pursue. And it's also very good that we have a, a guideline available about uh, the technical methodology. There are also paper uh, regarding uh, the interpretation criteria because it's very important to provide uh, everybody with standard method to report. One clear advantage that we have over MRI, uh, I mean, not to be in competition with radiologists, but the fact that we have uh, a clear a methodological standard, which has been jointly described by ENM and SNM, and the criteria for for reporting the scan. Well, given that, I guess that I thank you all for the attention. Again, I'm very happy to address any question. And uh, well, as I used to do, path to the future for everybody. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fanti, for this very thorough explanation, excellent presentation. Now we're going to start with Dr. Amaral, who is going to cover a little bit of Galen PSMA, but mostly F18 PSMA. So Dr. Amaral. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this webinar. And uh, we are very happy to present our recent experience with the introduction of Fluor 18 PSMA uh, in our institution. That we are working in the largest oncology institution in, in Chile. And we, we have in the same building our PET CT facilities and also the radio pharmacy with the cyclotron with production cells, all of them with the GMP quality uh, characteristic. So we have the IBA cyclotron 18, Nine, I, I think eight now is eighteen eighteen. The Siemens uh, flow camera and the uh, cells for production and, and to fractionate. We also have a an a next building when we have a second unit, second pet, just fifty meter from the cyclotron, where we mainly do all of our research with new radio pharmaceuticals, in, and now especially with. Fluoritin PSMA. Uh, well, the basis, as probably most of you know, uh, for all of these new pharmaceutical is based in, in the diagnosis and also in treatment in the concept of teranostic, uh, of tumor radiopharmaceutical addresses to a specific target. This is based on the characteristic of, of some tumors or, or tumor cells, there's some time of overexpression. A good example is a neuroendocrine tumor with a radiolated peptide, ligands in this particular case of prostate cancer, and also other, other type of tumor. This uh, uh, produce a delivery, radiation delivery only to the target cells and the normal tissue are protected. Well, uh, PSMA is a transmembrane glycoprotein, but it's not only expressed in prostate cancer. It's only in the normal prostatic epithelium, small intestine, renal tubular cell, and in salivary gland. Uh, the, the big difference is that this expression is between 100 to 1,000 times higher in a prostatic cancer, cancer uh, compared with the other tissue. So it's, it's very uh, specific for, uh, for prostatic carcinoma. Well, as uh, Professor Fanti mentioned before the introduction, the introduction of Cario PSMA, a uh, PET CD has proven to be highly sensitive and specific for detection of disseminated prostate cancer. And there are 
very good evidence that this appears super, superior, uh, superior in sensitivity and specificity to other agents, particularly coloring PET CT. And PSMA, that's been uh, recently labeled with fluoroethene, appear as a potentially better new ready pharmaceutical due to its physical characteristics and biodistribution. Well, the principle of like in in, in other uh, ready pharmaceutical is the design of the molecule with have some a uh, specific there's some specific receptor and binding motif, one linker and the ready level during moiety. This is it. Well, the clinical impact is modification of treatment at various stages of prostate cancer, uh, ranging from initial diagnostic to treatment and follow up of castration resistant metastatic disease. And also, as I mentioned, Professor Fanti in radiotherapy planning, what is changed in treatment in over 50% of the patient. What is of course, very important and very significant. Well, the most commonly uses use a PSMA ligand are described here in this slide. Well, it's some labeling with gallium and for therapy uh, with lutetium or actinium. And there are also some uh, molecular labeling with technetium. And in this uh, other sides are the other option that we are this uh, DCFP and e, AC, FDA approved, and we are talking about the fluoridine PSMA. Okay, Dr. Fakti mentioned that the gallium is good enough with excellent properties and clinical yield. However, they, they have some problems. So why we need to improve using the same molecule, uh, but using a, radio from, a, a radionuclide with better uh, characteristic, physical and logistic characteristics. One of the, in, in the most important, I guess, is the half-life difference. Gallium, as you know, it has only 68 minutes compared with the 110 minutes of the fluoridine. This facilitates in, uh, in a great way the, the logistic and the sending of the, this radio pharmaceutical to uh, far from the production center. There are also correct physical characteristics with the uh, uh, energy of the gamma rays with increased theoretically the maximum special resolution in the PET, e the cyclotron production with very high efficiency compared with the gallium generator, what is more, more limited in activity. Well, here is a design of the different molecules, and you see the PSMA 11, the PSA 1007, they have the same this part of the molecule is was the specific for the PSA me membrane. It's why we, we are using this as an alternative with some advantage. PSA labeled with fluoridine has a, a normal distribution, and you see one of the critical organs from radiation protection are the salivary, the salivary gland and the lacrimal glands. Also obtaining the spleen, the liver. In the kidney, there is a high contrast, but low excretion. And you see the lesser activity in, in, the, in the bladder. So it's more easy to detect the primary site or the nearby uh, tumor activity. There, hepatobiliary excretion also, so you can see the, the, the gut here. Well, there is a, some studies uh, with preclinical activity or wall of the biodistribution, the tumor to bug ratio, what is increasing with time, the 
time uh, in, in different organs and also time in tumor to, to, metast to mass ratio. Well, this is uh, the, the first in, in human where we have a follow up of uh, until uh, 480 minutes, and you see there is a rapid blood clearance. You see within 5 and 15 minutes, the vessel activity is decreasing, and uh, very few blood activity about six hours. Here is the curves, time, time activity curves uh, with a different uh, organ and they keep very stable. And this is the paper from Giselle with, uh, this is the injected dose, percentage of the injected dose over time and clear decline with time. So according to this uh, biodistribution and the relationship between different organs and, and blood pool and tumor, there is a comparison of activity in between an image at one hour and three hour post injection. And you see the different, even, even though that is better to have three hours, uh, the, the difference is not very, very high or very sig uh, significant. And of course, if we do the PET image at one hour post injection, they, they facilitate all the, the, the schedule of the patient and then no great difference if we, we, we keep the, the, the patient waiting for an extra uh, two hours. So we decide to to do the image at one hour in a similar way that with the Gallium 68. Well, our experience now with PSMA uh, from September 17 to February 18, we have done 195 PET studies. The age of this patient is uh, 68. The administrative activity was uh, 248 megabecquerels. And the time post injection was in, in average 33 minutes with a range from 47 to 186. The indication in our case for was in 58% for rest staging and primary staging with in 42%. This is the characteristic in, in these two groups. The, the age were similar, the PSA was in the, the race staging was lower than at the staging, 36, 10.7. The administrative activity was the same, and the time post injection was no difference. Well, at the staging, we see the prostate tumor in all of them, 100%. Lymph node metastasis in 37%, bone metastasis in 29, and visceral metastasis in, in almost 4%. This is a very, very important to, to consider when we use the theranostic uh, concept, because in only 30% of the patients, there was bone metastasis, and this is the, the target for a, another agent for therapy like uh, radion 2 to 3 or, or another diphosphonate. Here is the, the clinical data, no difference in age. It, this is for staging. PSA is a big difference with a patient with bone metastasis and those with uh, visceral metastasis. For rest staging, was uh, PET was negative in 21% and positive in 79%. So very very high level of possibility in, in rest staging. Yeah, here is the in, in the rest staging group. The, the age was a little bit lower in the negative PET compared with the positive PET. The PSA with the negative was only 1 and 13.4, is so highly significant. The, 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 the administrative activity was not different in, in, in both groups. For race staging, there is local recurrence in one third of the patient, lymph node metastasis in 
47%, bone metastasis with 30%, and visceral with 74%. The lymph node metastasis were 46 or 47% uh, in, in the pelvis, 34% pelvis plus retroperitoneal area, and in 18 or 19%. Pelvic, retroperitoneal, and supradiaphragmatic regions. For ray staging, the detection rate compared with the PSA level was similar with the other, uh, with, with gallium, where the, the PSA was below 0.5, was 46, 46 or 47 uh, percent detection rate. It's not different from between 0.5 and 1, over 1 or between 1 and 2, the, the, the detection rate was increased very significantly. And when it's over 2, is almost 96%. So there is a clear uh, dependency of the level of PSA. Well, uh, in, in one patient, we have the opportunity to, to make a side-by-side -side, PET study, one with gallium 68 and one with fluor 18. In the same patient, was a 65-year-old, recently with a diagnosis of cancer, prostate cancer, adenocarcinoma with Gleason 4 plus 3 and PSA 21. We compared, so both agents, one was almost 13, and the other one was over August 5. That was one, only one week. This is the, these are the image. This is the CD, gallium PSA, and fluor. Uh, the CD is nothing really significant. PSA show uptake on the primary site and one uh, adenopathy in, in, in the iliac or the iliac area. And just maybe a little, little bit in, in one rib and also very, very little in this uh, uh, vertebral body. If we compare with fluor, the activity in the uh, prostate bed is similar, but there is clearly better definition of the, uh, the this pathological lymph you node know, there. There are better definition also in this rib, and the more impressive is this focus on the vertebral body compared with the very, very teeny uptake there with nothing particularly uh, seen on the CD. So in this particular case, we, we think that we have an, at least one improvement detecting more lesion, one bone supposed to be a bone met in the ribs and in the vertebral body, plus better definition or with, in this uh, lymph node. Uh, the magnetic resonance had some, some question there, it's an, it's an area with different density, but was reported as negative. The patient was uh, uh, remitted for a robotic radial prostatectomy with pelvic, pelvic lymphadenectomy. The histological confirmation of the lymph node was confirmed. The positive PET CT findings outside of the pelvis were not histopathologically validated yet. We have no a proof of the, of the if this is a real pathological. However, after surgery, the patient had an initial decrease of PSA value, uh, but in the last measure, the value increased from 0.17 to 0.26. So this is a, an indi indicator of the there is a increase in the tumor in the tumor mass and probably. We, we can explain as a bone met metastasis. So there is some evidence, not histological approval, that the patient has 
uh, the, the fluoridine PSMA is correct. The fluoridine PSMA has some characteristics we have a, a highlight. The structure of the molecule is very similar in both cases and is the same that we use for lutetium PSMA. So the teranostic concept is here a very strong and even more strong than than the one with gallium 11, a one gallium PSMA 11. There is a higher in vitro affinity and the rate of internalization compared with gallium. There is a comparable, comparable effective dose per study. The lipophilic property have a strong impact on physiological distribution, hepatobiliary clearance, and very low elimination via kidney to bladder with less than 2% of the injected dose at two hours. They have ideal properties with very high spatial resolution or better spatial resolution due to the low posit positron energy, longer half-life, the possibility of late image, image also. This, character this characteristic may provide advantage for staging primary and bio biochemical re recurrent uh, prostate cancer. There is some image here with fluor, uh, itin, and lutetium PSA with the same molecule, and as you see, the, the very, very similar uh, presentation. Well, there is a direct leveling pre precursor developed by ABX. 3-methyl ammonium is an excellent leading group providing but, but very high yielding and elimination of protecting group. No need for the protection and no additional side product. And you see the molecule is almost identical. Here is the, the, our, our procedure, what is done with using the Sintera uh, box. And here is the, the process. There is commercially available kits from ABX and a fluoridine transfer purification, drying and labeling, and one milligram of precursor in, in 1.5 uh, ml of DMSO, seven minutes and 95 degrees. This is posteriorly the, the molecule is trapped, is trapped in, in a column cartridge and washed with water. Uh, for four or five times milliliters with ethanol to eliminate traces of the MSA, TBA, and free fluoridine. 18 PSMA is fractionated, eluted with 25% of ethanol, and the residual proportion is trapped on the, on the cartridge. So this is the in general. And the results are very high. Uh, they have a 56% of radiochemical yielding after 30 minutes in, in 36 uh, analysis. The quality control in using the standards procedure, you see in, in uh, HPLC, the specification is 9%. Our, our label is uh, yielding is 96 over the, the limit. Uh, the thin layer chromatography is 95, in our case is 97. The PSA we need to be less than 10 micrograms per ml, and we have three impurity one, two, uh, purity two, one for four, and all impurities. The range, the, toler the tolerance range is 50, and the, in the production at our lab is 3.4. Uh, the DMSO is less than 5,000, and in our case it's 50. And here is some, the, some of the uh, cure of, of this data. E and other very, very important aspect is the, the stability of the, of the labeling or the molecule is at least nine hours. So if, if we sum the half-life of the fluoridine 
blood dehydrogen stability, we have enough time to send this molecule in far away and uh, uh, think that this is, is not possible with gallium 68. These molecules are exactly the same, so we, we can use fluoridine and lutetium PSA for therapy or diagnosis. This is real therapeutic because the, both molecules are identical. In summary, PSMA radioligand PET-CT is the most sensitive and specific image method in prostate cancer, especially in a high-risk patient and biochemical recovery. Currently, its role to select the best personalized therapy is crucial. Gallium PSA is the most used and published up to now, and it has been proven to be relevant for the management of patients with prostate cancer. With fluoridine, have important advantage characteristic, principally the produced by a cyclotron facility at higher available amount of radioisotope in the Curie's range, is low positron emission energy, result in a higher image, image resolution, is hepatobiliary elimination, might is to evaluate the prostate bed and, and bed, bed in pelvis, facilitate patient schedule. This is very important for BC department and allow large load of daily operation distribution to remote PCT system, more than 1,000 kilometers away. We sent to Antofagasta, what is a, a city in the north, two hours by plane, and the stability up to nine hours. So this means that in, in Europe, you can send from, from one city to the other. This is the, our, our net of national and international collaboration. Thank you, thank you very much to all of you, all the attendees of, the, of this seminar. Thank you, Dr. Amaral, for the excellent presentation as well. You're right, it's time for the questions. Um, I have some of them here that were answered, so I'm not uh, picking up those ones. I will st I have, I'm selecting a few questions because there are many and some of them are too long to be answered. So there is one question, is PSMA 11? approved by a regulatory agency and if so who is the commercial supplier of the code kit professor fanti i think you can answer that one yeah sure it's my pleasure it's a very good question uh, unfortunately <laughs> the regulation are completely different uh, in different countries and even if uh, the european community you will be surprised uh, well not if you're european but if you are outside, that every country has its own regulation. Um, so it's almost impossible to address the question, if not on a national basis. For example, um, in Germany, you don't really need an authorization to make the synthesis. Uh, in Italy, you can make the synthesis within uh, an approved protocol, or you have to wait uh, that in the European Pharmacopeia it's published and indeed Gallium PSMA 11, uh, the draft has already been uh, completed and it's expected to be published in summer this year. So, uh, well, regulations are completely different in every country. You should refer to the regulatory agency of your own country where you live. Uh, regarding uh, uh, the commercial possibility, it's clear that you have a possibility to make that using cassette, uh, using cold kit. As far as I know, none of them uh, have an authorization for commercializing that uh, uh, into the Western Europe, but again, that's depending uh, on local regulation. We have been using uh, uh, the cassette uh, as well as the cold kit uh, for PSMA 11 labeled with gallium. We're very happy with the two of them. Uh, there are logistical uh, issues, uh, and of course, I have no experience, unfortunately, on fluorinated PSMA. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, it, and just to complete your disinformation, it's true, it's very local in the U.S. The regulations are different. So for people from the U.S., uh, PSMA 11, the cold kit, if, you, if it's required, or the generator or gallium chloride for whatever source, like a cyclotron, requires only a DMF. Why in Europe it requires a market authorization. That is also mm -hmm. a big difference between the continents. Okay, let's move on with the next questions. Um, so I have one 
if you can make some comments about the labeling of the PSMA 1007, uh, Dr. Amaral or maybe Vasco Kramer, if he's there, he could answer that question. Yes, Vasco is still here. He is our PhD and, and the, the, the in charge of, of research and developing in, in radio pharmacy. So he, I think he's a proper person to answer your question. Okay, so the labeling. So how about the label? The question is, is a little large, but it, you know, make some comments about the PSMA 1007 labeled with F18. So of course you mentioned the clinical part here, maybe a little bit more focus on the chemistry part, the stability, the synthesis, difficult, easy, yield, something like that. Maybe that's that was what the question intended. Well, uh, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Amaral, there's a commercial kit available, which is provided by ABX, which includes all the, the um, regions you need. Um, there's also a script available, which we use here at our site. Though, so the labeling is straightforward. It's a direct nucleophilic uh, uh, substitution, which yields up to 60% radiochemical yield. And maybe the most important point to mention here is the radiochemical purity, which is very, very good and over 95% in case you start with activities up to uh, Curie or 75, 80 gigabecara. If you go up about this activity, uh, you have to take care of the uh, radiochemical purity. It can get lower than 95 uh, um, 95 percent, and this is something we are we are validating at the moment. But a part of that uh, use of higher activities, there are no issues uh, with with the synthesis. So I don't know okay. if there are more specific questions about some certain processes or quality controls. No, no, not really. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to a very specific question for the clinicians. How to deal with a single rib lesion, probable malignant, score four out of five on PSMA PET in recurrent setting? Always try to confirm with another modality or biopsy? Uh, yeah, okay. if you want, I can take it. Uh, yes, because, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, after a couple of years experience, at the very beginning, uh, uh, again, given that we were running a trial, we tried to have an histopathological confirmation of revolution. Uh, of course, it's very complicated, especially for bone lesion. So in that case, we would have preferred uh, a confirmation uh, with another imaging method. So you would go carefully through the CT because as everybody knows, MRI in the rib is not so reliable. Uh, in most cases, you can see uh, little, uh, uh, let's say, alteration in the CT, usually of uh, a dense uh, areas uh, that can confirm um, which is not necessarily always true because in many cases uh, you will see with PSMA something which is already not possible to see at CT because it's well known that it's uh, earlier and more sensitive. Uh, so at the beginning we did our best. I have to be honest, after two years experience right now, in most cases we do our best. Uh, we especially try to run to exclude every cause of false positive related to recent uh, trauma or inflammatory cause uh, by asking the patient if he had a recent uh, um, fracture or something like that. Um, but right now clinicians are very, very confident in our findings. So they most likely, if it's a single rib lesion, they will uh, after that uh, tend to treat it with external beam radiation therapy if it's uh, just one lesion. So very oligometastatic early disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we are reaching the end. I have one short question and one that will probably take more time. So I'm going to the short one first and then uh, we're going to get the last one. So at which time point after injection, F18 PSMA 1007 should be PET imaging performed best? One hour? As in the presentation, some data suggests that later time point imaging at two hours would be better. Uh, maybe Dr. Amaral, you can answer that one. Yes, the, well, one, one uh, very important uh, issue is the, the logistic. So if we have a patient waiting for two hours in the waiting rooms or, or in the box, 
uh, produce some some problems and the the quality of the image is not improved significantly. Of course, it's, it's better from the theoretical point of view, but for the clinical aspect, I think is one hour is perfectly uh, acceptable and more reasonable. Uh, I think this is a good a good point, and the, you see the quality of the image is improving also for the physical characteristic and so on. so. I, I think you, uh, I should prefer one hour and not wait with with uh, one hour uh, and you have one half life lost. With the uh, one hour you have one half of the half dose, so the the. The, the flow of, of, of photon or signal is much better with a fluor 18 at one hour compared with the gallium. Yeah, I hope that answered the question. Um, I have one longer question, but I before I do that question, I'm going to to uh, to make a comment because it came out another question about the FDA, the regulatory aspect again. Uh, so here I have one before I move on to the last one. Do you know if the FDA we approved it soon? So probably it's mentioned in the Gallium 68 PSMA. There was a DMF recent filed for the Gallium PSMA 11 uh, in the, the, the US, I think Telex uh, Pharmaceuticals together with NMI. So this is one thing, this is a good step forward. And then we have to also register the Gallium Chloride. So maybe that answers the question. Just to complete the first question, I'm going back to the very last one because it's it's time to go. Um, the difference, how different PSMA from a specificity, sensitivity, et cetera, standpoint, com when you compare PSMA 1007, the PU compound from Progenix, PSMA 11, Gallium 68. Which one shows best FXC? What are the main differences? <laughs> <laughs> Difficult, right? I, that's, I said that's the last one. That will take long. <laughs> no, I can tell very good. In our country, in Chile, uh, there, there are no formal regulations for radio pharmaceutical. This is a, a work in progress. And we can, we can do uh, all of this study uh, under our own responsibility, following the, the concept of the Magist magistral recipe mm -hmm. and all the, the publications show that fluor 18 PSMA is at least as good as the gallium. So uh, there is some good advantage and well, like all of them I, I mentioned. So this is why we have the possibility to to, to do a, a, a lot of studies or to switch from one a uh, very pharmaceutical to other. In the past, we start with choline. This was a uh, cancel or switch to gallium 68. And now I think the next step it should be a uh, fluor 18. We have this this patient that I, I, I present, and it was a very uh, difficult clinical decision because we have demonstrated, not demonstrated, but highly suspicious of bone meds not show in the gallium and the clinical uh, uh, solution of the clinical behavior is completely different <laughs> if he has she really has a bone meds or a, or only has lymph nodes yeah and so in that case the what we really need is to make biopsy to prove but we are uh, using the the other way is to see the progression of PSA. Marco, I think you want to say something. Mark? I just wanted to mention. So you you asked about the compound from Progenix, uh, which um, has been compared in one study to the Fluor PSMA 1007, and uh, basically you could say that both compounds are very excellent for imaging PSMA with an 18F labeled compound. Um, but there's a difference uh, due to the biodistribution. So the uh, progenics compound is excreted uh, um, more over the bladder, so you have a higher uptake in the bladder. So this would be an advantage for the PSMA 1007. The other side, you have a very high liver uptake for PSMA 1007, which could favor 
the compound of progenics, but overall both compounds uh, yield excellent results in, in the first clinical uh, trials and comparisons. So maybe this is directed to your question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fanti, any comment? Any? I know you don't have that much of experience, but maybe you have read something about the pew compound, the 1007 and the... Oh, I guess that I would make a comment based on our long-lasting discussion about uh, the um, neuroendocrine uh, tumor compounds uh, Dota Tate, Dota Knock, Dota Talk. So I ended up with the Dota What, that was my favorite compound. Uh, <laughs> because, okay, you can make an evaluation uh, of uh, affinity of the molecule that will be modified by the isotope. But at the very end, uh, they are all very good compounds. So it comes to logistical problem. It comes to commercialization and availability. I guess that as just mentioned it, they all have uh, advantages, pro and cons. Uh, it comes to very logistical uh, uh, situation. That's to say what's available, what you can purchase, uh, what you can have at a lower price, what has a better yield of uh, radio labeling and so on. So it, it's not just about affinity, of course. Okay. Well, I fully agree with this uh, answer. I share it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Mara. That was really the idea of the webinar, to, to show all the possibilities you can do for the prostate cancer imaging. I thank you everyone for your participation. I still have got some questions left, last minute questions arriving at five o'clock CET time. So unfortunately we cannot answer all of them. We'll try to answer them uh, after the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed, you have learned something. And again, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your engagement. And thank you to Professor Fanti and Dr. Amaral for the excellent presentations and for answering the questions.